Today's lecture is on uh, cannabis around the world. And so I'm really going to be sharing things that I've learned uh, in various ways because my experience around the world outside of Canada is quite limited. And uh, I'll probably not talk much about this country at all because that's most of the focus uh, in, in at least uh, this, this lecture series. And so I'll start with our neighbor, the United States, probably the most obvious place to begin because the war on drugs and the war on cannabis in particular has uh, really found a, a, a home, I guess, in the United States of America. And it's uh, very much a, a corporate, you know, world um, uh, policy. Uh, but the United States and, and the government uh, of the United States has been used by industry and lobby groups to promote and, and push the war on drugs, uh, at least initially more than anyone in the world. Now, there are countries around the world where people are killed uh, and executed, uh, I should say, executed quite publicly, um, China and, and, and others in Asia. Uh, I think for the most part, I don't think there's public, edu public executions of drug uh, dealers or otherwise uh, in uh, any other part of the, the world, but certainly in, in many parts of Asia that is still practiced. Um, although usually it's for heroin dealers, it is occasionally uh, uh, applied or, or used on people that are involved in cannabis. Or, anyway, in the United States, uh, while they don't kill people uh, r right away, they do throw them in jail for extensive periods of time, if not for life. Uh, I think the state of California has the three strikes zero rule still, which is why their prison system has got to the point of being over capacity and now apparently they're being told that they have to release prisoners um, because there's too many people in the jails and so um, California because of you know that the war on drugs is really uh, you know driving itself to bankruptcy uh, and causing far greater harm than that. Um, but uh, um, I guess, you know, kind of starting with California, it's this, you know, weird mix of politics and people in the United States. And the state of California itself is like the fifth largest economy, I think, in the world. It's just, it's huge, uh, the uh, amount of money that is going through that, that particular state. And uh, while the federal government is very much putting money into the, the war on drugs still and imprisoning people as much as possible. The state of California and many of the law enforcement officials in it have essentially turned a blind eye. And uh, since Proposition 215 was passed in, I think, 1995, which was for medical purposes, more and more people have, have pushed the definition of what is medical has been pushed. Uh, doctors uh, are signing forms for um, all sorts of issues and uh, really it's almost become in some essence for the rich legal in California if you can pay to get a doctor visit to sign your forms. It's illegal for the people that are too poor to pay for a doctor's visit and get the cards and such like that but um, it's uh, something where there's like 800 m medical dispensaries in California uh, and uh, that's twice as many as it was just a year ago. And so the medical cannabis uh, issue in, in that state has really, you know, put things to a point where, where Arnold Schwarzenegger and the government are considering, you know, <coughs> trying to, to legalize and tax it for the, the revenues that they're ignoring right now, essentially. Um, now the entire U.S. isn't like that. Certainly the federal government doesn't either. Each state is almost slowly breaking down its laws separately. And it's happening in all sorts of interesting ways. Uh, uh, I, I don't know how big Keene is, but this town in New Hampshire, I guess, I think it was a week ago Sunday, two guys having a 420 decided something like, we're going to just sit here and smoke pot till uh, we have enough people and they can't ignore us, whatever. So we'll meet back at 420 Monday, next day, and every day. Next day there was 6, Tuesday 16, Wednesday 30. By Thursday there were 70 of them. I think this past Sunday, I don't know how many, I didn't see a number, but they stormed the police station and lit up in the police station. <laughs> like a whole crowd of them and the police just ignored it. No one got arrested. And they're just going on and, and the, the media and, and everyone, the, the, the city officials are, are saying, well, 
they'll give up when the weather starts getting bad, and they'll, they'll move indoors when the weather gets bad. But anyway, uh, it's been refreshing to see some of the activism, the very you know brave souls in the United States standing up to the government. On the other hand, you know, it's a war machine, and, and most people here uh, would likely know about Mark Emery uh, putting himself uh, um, in, into their hands this week with his extradition trial. Um, there are still raids occurring in California by the federal DEA, <coughs> apparently picking off the profit motive, or motivated clubs, but regardless, um, the United States is this just weird quagmire. And now that Obama's got in, um, he also hired uh, or brought um, the, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, the chief of police from Seattle that probably came in after Norm Stamper. I'm not sure how much of a, or if there was someone else in between. And I, I forget the guy's last name. But anyway, the new drugs are, at first everybody thought he was going to be great. And they built up all these things about him, in part because under Seattle, well, he was chief of police. It was like the lowest pl uh, arrest rate in the country and for a large city for pet possession. And uh, the Hemp Fest in Seattle this year, they had a quarter million people there. They expected like 150,000. It was like 250,000 people there this August. And so, uh, you know, really uh, Seattle in, in many ways, also the, the state of Washington, their medical marijuana program it has become in some sense almost more infiltrated. Um, into the state system that it has in California, where they've been left to, to regulate themselves. So things have been happening in, in Seattle and Washington State as well, and everybody thought this drug czar was going to be the best thing to happen uh, for us. And so uh, um, I think they, uh, you know, officially declared in the last year that the war on drugs was lo over, lost uh, in the United States. and are trying to say that it's a war on addiction. I think it came out like six months or so. It's just like bogus, really. It's just softening the terms. But anyway, uh, yeah, things are, are you know happening down there. But I should go on. Mexico. Um, that country's being torn to hell because of the war on drugs. We're supposed to be talking about cannabis around the world. Um, certainly uh, the drug cartels down there are also uh, shipping um, cocaine up to the United States. I think if you get into the picture gallery on the web page, I've got the um, PowerPoint that I have. And I've found this interesting picture of Mexico where it shows you which cartel is in charge of which area, what they're producing or what or how, uh, or, or you know, they're connected from the flow of cocaine like on the land up into the United States and across the border. There's all sorts of different, they call them cartels, but, you know, uh, 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 groups of, of networks, you know, very organized, very deadly. You know, a couple of Canadians were just killed last week down there, just part of the kind of wheeling and dealing that goes on down there. Life is less valuable than it used to be for some of these people, I think. And so, uh, yeah, there's, I don't know how many tens of thousands being killed down there directly related to the drug war, but... I have heard from uh, several people that have escaped out of Mexico, actually some students here who've left Mexico City because it has become so, so violent that you don't know if you're going to be kidnapped or anything could happen at times uh, for, for the, some of the people down there and it's hard to feel safe at all. And so that country's been, been torn apart. Um, on the other hand, I have a funny little Mexico story that I had to share because you know, uh, if you go down there as a tourist, it's actually really hard to, to find pot because they're scared of being busted by the local authorities. So if you go back in the hills, you can. But I went down there in 1991 when I was a university student, with a bunch of money, and I drank a lot back then. So anyway, it was like almost the last day I was there, and I hadn't smelt any Mexican pot or anything, but I knew it was everywhere. So I'm sitting in the bar with my buddies, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get some pot. There's pot here. I know it. So I just went into the kitchen and sat down on a countertop and there was all these women running around and like 10 or 12 year old kids, you know, getting food ready and they ignored me for a few minutes and then one of them, one of the kids and ladies came up to me and he's like, Mr. What are you doing? You can't the kitchen. You have to go. Okay, yeah, dude. So that you could see her thinking, okay, blah, blah, blah. Okay, mister, what do you want? And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> took about half 